Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inside ETF's weekly webinar, Why Commodities, Not Stocks, Bonds, or Bitcoin, Are the Key to 2018. My name is Matt Hogan, and I'm the CEO of Inside ETFs, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. You know, it does strike me that in today's market, you could argue that almost everything is in a bit of a bubble. Stocks, emerging markets, bonds, real estate, art, Bitcoin, everything is at or near all-time highs. The one thing missing from that equation is, of course, the oldest investment class of all, commodities. But could that oversight be a key to portfolio strong performance in 2018? And could today's lows be the quiet before a storm of higher prices? Joining me to talk about this are four exceptional leaders in commodities and commodity investing. John Baffs is Senior Economist at the World Bank. He's currently managing the Commodities Markets Outlook, a World Bank quarterly publication focusing on commodity market analysis and price forecasts. If you haven't read his blog or seen his research, we highly recommend it. Uh, we were really excited to get him on today's webinar. Joining John is Maxwell Gold. He is Director of Investment Strategy for ETF Securities. Uh, he's an experienced investment strategist with a focus on macroeconomics, commodities, asset allocation, and ETFs. And of course, ETF Securities has been a global leader in providing commodity ETFs uh, for many years. Ryan Katz is National Sales Director for USCF, the first broad-based commodity ETF issuer in America and still one of the most forward-looking firms with some innovative products that provide unique exposure to the commodity markets. Jeff Weinsma is Senior Portfolio Manager for Elkhorn Capital Group, which has a commodity ETF that was recently named a hidden gem by us here at Eatside ETFs for the, the strong exposure and, and careful construction it provides to commodities. Today's webinar has two parts. First, John and I are going to have a Q&A about the outlook for commodities. That will cover about the first 10 minutes of this webinar. I really want to hear where he thinks commodities as a group is going, where individual commodity sectors are going, and what could influence that forecast in the months to come. Then we're going to turn things over to the three ETF providers to give you three different approaches to investing in commodities. So sit tight. It should be a good 25 minutes. Everything you need to know about commodities, we're ready to go. Uh, let's start with you, John. John, first of all, thanks so much for joining the webinar. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, our first question, you know, as I mentioned at the top of the, my, my speech, kind of, commodities are really the only major asset class that's not trading at all-time highs. Can you give us just a, a one-minute overview of where commodity prices have been over the past year, uh, what you're forecasting for the year ahead, and what's really driving that uh, forecast? Uh, yes. Uh, commodity prices, well, they have kind of followed diversion paths throughout the year. Uh, first, we saw a kind of recovery, I would say, in oil prices, energy prices in general, oil prices in particular. Uh, we also saw some uh, quite substantial boost in uh, most, but not all, metal prices. Uh, but we did not see much of a change in agricultural prices or metal prices. Now, uh, on the industrial commodities, and I mean both energy and metals, uh, the factors that were behind the boost on the energy side, or rather the oil side, we had two kind of, uh, uh, of factors. One was that uh, uh, China uh, sort of increased its demand for oil, perhaps a little more than we anticipated earlier in the year. And the second, of course, factor was the fact that OPEC stepped in to uh, sort of regulate or cut supplies. And uh, in fact, what happened from the OPEC and non OPEC side, including Russia, that is, uh, what we observed is that uh, the compliance rate was uh, much higher compared to historical standards. And third, of course, we had some uh, strengthening of demand by OECD countries, which was kind of surprising and at the same time unprecedented by historical standards. So to summarize on energy, we had uh, OPEC restraint, some demand growth in China, and a lot of demand growth in OECD countries, which boosted oil prices. On metals, the story there is similar in the sense that we had some boost from the demand side from China, but we also had some cuts 
in supplies from China, and that was because of the environmental sort of reasons. That's why we had the boost in metals. Now, on agriculture, we have not seen much there in the sense that we have markets which, for the most part, are well supplied. Uh, we don't see, we did not see much movements uh, throughout the year, and we do not want to see much uh, in the coming year. All right, so not not much excitement on uh, on ags. Let's talk a little bit more about energy. Um, you know, so you, you saw greater than expected compliance from OPEC on, on the cuts. Um, at the same time, you know, we haven't seen energy even thinking about returning to the hundred dollar a barrel level for crude. Um, you know, what what would it really take to set oil prices significantly higher? Is that even an option, or are there secular forces at work that put a long-term cap on that uh, price? Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, the big question of all, are we going to go back to the 100 or not? And our views are probably not. We're not going to see the $100 per barrel. At least we're not going to see any time soon. And by any time soon, I do not mean the time frame is not a month, it's perhaps years. And uh, I think there are two fundamental forces behind the energy crisis in general, and especially oil price in particular. One is the emergence of shale oil uh, from the United States that we believe has kind of uh, fundamentally altered the dynamics in the oil market. And uh, not only shale oil has brought in uh, probably a bit more than 5 million barrels per day, which is quite a bit of oil if you consider that the global oil consumption is 95 million barrels per day. So on the one hand, we have a lot of oil coming from the United States and shale. Uh, and what we have also seen, especially in the last two to three years, is that uh, we have considerable um, uh, productivity improvements in the U.S. shale oil industry. Uh, if I could put a couple, a couple of numbers behind those improvements, uh, probably most of the industry was profitable at around $70 three years ago. Now they are profitable around $50 to $55. So most of the industry can make money with $55 per barrel. So that's one aspect. Right. And the other aspect in the oil market is that we have seen kind of weakening demand. That's, I'm talking about a longer trend here. That's because of the efficiency gains that we have seen across the entire energy sort of consumption spectrum, be it electric cars, uh, start and go technology, more efficient cars, and then we have some environmental kind of restrictions that uh, cut across uh, all countries, perhaps not as much in the United States, but more so in Europe and perhaps in, uh, uh, in China. So basically the oil price is kind of squeezed now between an efficient USL shale oil industry and uh, headwinds from the demand side because of efficiency gains and some environmental regulations. That's why we think that the $100 per barrel is not something uh, that we may see in the Right. Are there any areas within the energy industry where, you know, there, there are different price trends? Is natural gas set on a different path? Or are there other commodities that uh, might... Yes. See more inflection. Uh, yes. In, in fact, uh, natural gas price, in fact, uh, when we talk about natural gas prices, we are talking about three, so to speak, segmented, segmented markets. One, which is the United mm -hmm. States, which follows its own supply and demand conditions. Uh, you have one in Europe, which is, for the most part, linked through pipes within Europe and uh, with uh, the Asian suppliers, and then you have the LNG market, which is a market relevant to East Asian consumers, especially Japan. Now, as I said, the North American market is pretty much independent in pricing mechanism, but the other two markets, European and LNG for East Asia, until now they were linked to oil. So they were had high prices until 2014 when oil prices were about $100 per barrel, and then Following the collapse of oil prices, we also noticed, uh, as expected, the decline in the prices of uh, natural gas in Europe and in LNG. But what we see now, we see a kind of gradual linking of the prices of LNG for East Asia as well as European from oil prices. And that's because what we see is independent markets, especially in the area of LNG, where we have much more supplies, and we see kind of the emergence of a spot pricing there. 
So we see less leakage as we move forward from the European and especially the energy markets, uh, from the oil market. Now, in terms of trends, uh, what we expect is we see probably the energy market as more supplies come in and we have more uh, capacity built in by major exporters, and that of course includes the United States. Uh, we are going to see probably more lower prices in the longer term from uh, LNG. Now on coal. Awesome. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. Go on. Sure. No, no, no. Well, I, 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 I am conscious of uh, conscious of time. I uh, wanted to get a few more questions, and I, 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 you know, I'm super interested in energy, so I probably asked too many questions. Let's quickly cover base and and uh, base metals and. I think you did cover AGs. So base metals have been, you know, slowly rising uh, for maybe a year and a half now. Um, but the same story is true in base metals as is true in oil, and, and that's they're a long way off their peaks. Um, you know, what would it, it, do you see that trend continuing uh, of continued, you know, increases? Do you see it reaching back to the peaks we were at maybe seven or eight years ago? Uh, you mean for metals? Uh, I don't yeah, think for metals. So. Uh, the, yeah, the metals. I don't think so. And here we have also the same similar arguments. Of course, we don't have shale in metals. But what happens in metal? What happened in metals is that as prices rose uh, in the early, in the mid to late 2000, uh, so we had a lot of capacity coming in. So that was one fundamental reason behind the metal price boom. But what we also saw in the metals markets, as it was to some extent too in the oil market, was that part of the price increase reflected what uh, uh, some uh, industry sort of representatives call uh, cost inflation. Uh, so it's not only a demand story, but it's also an inflation story in the sense that metal producers and to some extent oil producers had to pay higher prices, either for wages or for equipment, to rent equipment, to buy equipment. Uh, but as the supplies increased, those input prices declined. So, and what we are seeing now is that those suppliers pay lower input prices. And that's why we don't believe that uh, we're going to go back to the highs that we sort of experienced back in 2008 and also in 2011. So, there is a net of energy. You have a, a demand story, a gross demand story, but you also have a cost story there. And that's one of the reasons, the second rather reason, why you want to see that as an experiment. Nice. All right, makes sense. My last question, and we have about one minute left. Uh, you know, what I'm hearing is uh, a feeling that commodity prices, you know, aren't really going up much. They aren't really going down much. They're fairly steady. Um, yes. I guess, you know, there's this idea that commodities move in super cycles. What would it take for us to enter another super cycle on commodities? Is that even a possibility? Uh, I mean, Commodities, yeah, as you know, as we all know, are predictable, unpredictable. Uh, I would say that uh, a possibility would be if you have uh, another set of countries or one country that would be India, for example, and it sort of mimics the consumption patterns of China because we should not right. that the fact that part of the boom was because of China which was exclusively, yep. I would say, responsible for metals and partially responsible for energy. So if you have a, another emerging economy, India, or a group of emerging economies that kind of mimic in one way or another China, that's what I think is paid for a super cycle that realizes the government. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Which worth. Uh, not, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, no, worth watching, and certainly India has been top. John, I really appreciate you coming on today. John Baffs is Senior Economist at the World Bank. He manages the Commodity Markets Outlook and writes a great blog. If you're a commodity investor and you don't read it, you're missing out. So um, thanks very much, John, for joining. And everyone, uh, do check uh, out John's, uh, John's you know, research output. It's really top-notch, as I think you heard from that conversation. Um, now I want to turn the page. I want to talk about how investors can invest in commodities. Uh, if you're still bullish like I am and, uh, and you're looking for that exposure, we have three experts, three different approaches. Um, I'll turn it over first to you, Maxwell. Maxwell is uh, 
Director of Investment Strategy for ETF Securities. Tell us, you know, what ETF Securities is thinking about in the commodity space and, and the kind of exposure that you can provide. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Matt. And, you know, overall, just to introduce myself, my name is Maxwell Gold. I'm the Director of Investment Strategy focused on research outlook for the commodities asset class. And we at uh, ETF Securities are actually uh, quite, you know, very bullish for commodities going into 2018 for a couple of factors that, uh, you know, that John had just recently pointed out in his outlook. And overall, you know, we do expect commodities to continue to stabilize and, you know, really continue rebalancing on the fundamentals. You know, supply side factors are, are beginning to weigh on output production. That includes, you know, further supply discipline by oil producers, further reduction of investment by a lot of the miners globally, and that's beginning to weigh on the supply side. Additionally, we're seeing demand pick up from different factors. We're seeing a rise of manufacturing, industrial production, as well as building a rising of inflationary pressures that may be just the weaker dollar, but it also is reflective of higher producer inflation as well as consumer inflation. And so those, these key factors of you know, really global growth continuing and a rebalancing of fundamentals is what, you know, why we are you know, uh, further bullish for uh, commodities going into next year. And what I wanted to really touch upon is less so outlook, but really thinking about from a portfolio context, a more holistic view of how to incorporate or think about commodities and uh, you know, how you define them as an asset class and how to think about them within your asset allocation and portfolio decisions. And the slide in front of you, you can sort of see some of the key takeaways that you know, I summarize in a lot of my research is you know, where, what is the role of commodities and what they can bring to you in terms of a portfolio. I think first and foremost, the, key, the first benefit for a broad commodity exposure uh, through a basket of commodities with exposure to energy, ags, industrial metals, and precious metals is that they serve as a key alternative asset. And what that means is essentially they have risk management benefits, they can provide diversification, and you can see the chart to the top right that you know, regardless of the commodity index, whether it be the Bloomberg Commodity Index or the S&P GSEI, you can see that the, they have a low correlation to not just stocks and bonds, but also a, a, a mix or a stock bond portfolio going back several decades. And I think that persistent low correlation is really what, what is a, a key investment characteristic of commodities, in, in my view. And really, when I add commodities to my asset allocation, I have an expected real return of zero. I expect them to keep up with inflation, but really what I'm putting them in my strategic asset allocation for is a way to manage volatility, manage, a diver, uh, manage risk, as well as gain exposures that are inherently linked to the global growth cycle and inflationary pressures. And you can see that sort of the chart at the bottom where you see that on average, you know, the year-over-year -year return for different commodity sectors when we see a, 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 a commensurate rise in inflation of 50 basis points is that commodities perform very well. So they do serve as that inflation hedge as an asset. And so that's a really uh, one of the key investment uh, traits that I look for when utilizing commodities in my portfolios. Additionally, as we're seeing the dual engine of growth, both the developed markets and emerging markets continue to rise, we expect that commodity demand will, will keep up and uh, think that will be a key catalyst for commodity prices uh, going into next year uh, additionally. And then finally, you know, one of the key factors when you think about investing in commodities is really is the imp implementation choices, the index selection if you're being more passive, the active management the strategy side of it, or even uh, you know, which futures contracts or which uh, commodities to select and how far to go. And you know, at ETF Securities, we have uh, you know, a lot of uh, broad-based commodity ETFs uh, as well as uh, subsector ETFs, but you know, one to highlight is ticker BCI. It, has, uh, it tracks the Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is the most diversified commodity index out there. Additionally, we're one of the cheapest uh, ETFs on the market at only 29 basis points and has no K1. So I think that's something to, to keep in consideration if you're thinking about an allocation to broad-based uh, diversified basket of commodities. Just turning to the next slide, just briefly, I want to just have a, a side conversation just talking about precious metals, because in my view, I actually think that precious metals are uh, an, a separate asset class compared to commodities. I view them as, as uh, peers, you know, side by side within my asset allocation. And the reason being is that when you look at precious metals, they serve even more so as a distinct core risk management tool. They help hedge against systemic risk, against geopolitical risk, currency risk, inflation risk, as well as uh, persistent equity drawdowns. And you can see that's the chart on the top right where you see precious metals compared to other liquid real assets or liquid alternatives, that they have the lowest correlation to not just U.S. equities but global equities as well. 
And so I think that, you know, that source is a, as a core risk management tool to help improve your diversification, your risk taking in a portfolio. It really separates them as, as a distinct asset class compared to commodities. And then just to highlight, you know, how I think about precious metals is that, you know, regardless of your risk profile, you can, you can achieve a higher efficiency or you can have benefits from incorporating an active allocation to, to precious metals. And so that's, you know, really to highlight that the optimal allocation, you know, is never zero. Um, I'd say about anywhere from zero, uh, from two to 10% makes sense depending on your risk profile. But, you know, certainly there are benefits to be had by having an active allocation to broad commodities as well as precious metals as a distinct uh, line item in your portfolio. And then just turning to one slide, you know, I highlighted the low correlation of precious metals. And really, you know, what, where I think that the benefit, you know, looking beyond just, say, gold, which tends to get a lot of the lion's share of attention, is to highlight, you know, that there are other uh, precious metals such as silver, platinum, and palladium. You know, they tend to be a little bit more cyclical, and, you know, they tend to outperform gold when we're in these growth cycles, when we're in these rising inflation cycles, such as the current market environment for this year and going into next year. And so that's really my outlook, is I expect some of those other precious metals, such as silver, platinum, palladium, to potentially outperform gold next year. And I think that that you know, warrants the case to say that when you're looking at the sources of demand, it's not just uh, countercyclical being investment demand or, or risk taking, uh, or sorry, um, you know, uh, risk off uh, mentality, but it's also cyclical demand such as jewelry, electronics, auto industry, as well as solar panels for silver. So I think that you know, with this cyclical and countercyclical sources of demand that come online to different stages of the economic cycle, that creates that persistent low correlation, which makes precious metals a great diversifier for portfolios. And if you're, you're thinking about a way to access that, I would just you know, highlight one of our, uh, one of our key uh, products, uh, ticker GLTR. This is a diversified basket yep. of precious metals, and it holds gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And it's really the turnkey solution to get a broad base exposure to precious metals, to not, not just gold, but some of those more industrial sensitive precious metals that tend to outperform in a rising growth, rising inflation environment. So I'd certainly, uh, I'd say if you're, you're thinking about an exposure to the metal side, you know, take, take a look at uh, our product here with some information. But with that, I'll turn it back Absolutely. to you, Matt. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. A lot of good information in there. I know we're trying to move, uh, move fast, give people a bunch of ideas. Um, so that was great. Going to turn it over now to Ryan Katz, National Sales Director for United States Commodity Funds, uh, USCF. Ryan, take it away. Appreciate it, Max. Um, you know, I'm just going to hammer home a, a few points for, uh, that Maxwell uh, mentioned here about maybe why commodities and why now. Uh, first, obviously, uh, as you can see here on this slide, we've got comparable returns going back almost 60 years to stock. It's been a little bit different the past five or six years. Hopefully, I'll be able to get into that and, and why. But the second point here you'll see is obviously low correlation to stocks uh, and bonds. Uh, we feel like it's definitely a significant uh, part of the alternative sleeve, maybe not your only diversifier, uh, but, but again, a, a crucial piece and definitely a, a small allocation of commodities has been uh, proven by or countless studies showing that it will improve your, your risk-adjusted returns. And then from there, positive correlation to inflation. As you can see, uh, stocks and bonds are negatively, negatively correlated to inflation and uh, with commodities having a positive correlation. Now, I'm going to Bring in a, a couple slides from our partners at Summerhaven. They are the index provider for USCI's so Summerhaven Dynamic Commodity Index. And what they've done here is shown, uh, what I'm going to do first is show basically how equities and fixed income have done this decade and then how commodities have done. So what I have here is a time series. Each gray line is actually a 10-year period. And they started these gray lines one every month since 1959. So as you can see, so far this decade, Equities have done very well, as everyone knows. Likewise, bonds also doing very well, close to 95th percentile. Your standard 60-40 equity bond portfolios are right on that 60, uh, I'm sorry, that 95th uh, percentile of performance. So, you know, a lot of people feel like equities are pretty expensive right now. That's where commodities have been this decade. It's obviously a little more volatile, um, but a tough time for commodities. And we would definitely point to the uh, low and, and really downward trending inflationary environment that we've been in. So back to that point, you'll see here, obviously commodities extremely are, are highly correlated to inflation, but also moving inflation, inflation shock, whether inflation is increasing or decreasing. Um, 
here on the left side of the, the I have three tercials, the left side showing, um, you know, decreasing inflationary environment. Again, this is about the past 60 years or so. Uh, decreasing inflation stocks and bonds do very well in a flat, uh, you know, in, uh, inflation not moving. Everyone wins. But really where commodities are going to perform well is when in inflation is, is spiking or increasing, and that's when your stocks and bonds are going to drag some. So that's going to get us to the ETF that I'd like to discuss is USCI. It's our, our broad basket commodity index uh, strategy that we partnered with Summer Haven on. One of the founders of Summer Haven is Geert Rauenhorst, who's a Yale professor, and he published the facts and fantasies of commodity futures back in 2006. His white paper was adopted by Kaya and CFA level two coursework. And this graph kind of shows the crux of a, a lot of what the research uh, has shown. And what we're trying to do with the, the, the ETF really is, uh, is invest in commodities that are in low inventory. So what we have here uh, is showing the red line and equally weighted commodity index, and then the exact same commodities split into your relative high inventories and relative low inventories. As you can see, there's our commodity beta. Uh, the yellow line and the gray line never have the same two commodities in them, but they're, they're obviously correlated. The main difference being the uh, return capture. So what we are trying to do with USCI is invest in commodities that are scarce or in low inventory. The problem with that is that uh, inventory data lag is inaccurate the first time it comes out. There just isn't reliable inventory data out there real time uh, for many commodities. So we use a couple of, uh, of proxies. The first being the shape of the futures curve. Uh, I'll, I'll do a quick overview of uh, contango and backwardation here. Contango meaning you're buying in basically at a premium, a backwardation buying in kind of at a discount. So think of contango as a, a headwind uh, for investors investing in commodities, backwardation kind of a tailwind. So I've got two separate commodities here. WTI and copper demonstrating the, the same point. Uh, this is actually showing on trailing inventory levels versus what the futures curve looked like at that time. So on the left, you'll see when inventories are high, basis is negative, but commodities in backward or is in contango, excuse me. As inventories come down, you get a positive basis. Uh, the, it goes into backwardation, the futures curve. The same point is being shown here um, with copper. On, on the right graph there. Yep. So that goes. And Ryan, to we have about to our 30 seconds just to just to just to give you an overview. Sure. Okay, great. So what we do with USCI is we take the 27 most liquid uh, commodities, all traded in U.S. dollars, across the six commodity sectors. We first rank them by backwardation. We take the seven that are most backwardated. Think of most favorable shaped futures curve for an investor. They go into the index. Of the remaining 20, we take the seven with the greatest 12-month price momentum. And then the only override is a diversification step. So if after our selection process, we don't have at least one commodity across all six sectors, we'll drop out our, most, our, our least conviction pick and add in the best of the missing sector. And we also do curb optimization. We're not entirely in the front month uh, futures contract for every commodity. If the uh, commodity is in, in contango, we may be a little further out on the futures curve, try and uh, you know, catch, catch the flattest part, and then likewise, commodities and backwardation, we want to maximize that to catch the steepest part of the curve. So, as you see, we get a much more balanced color wheel in terms of our average sector weights against the GSCI and BCOM, yeah. and, and we feel like our selection process is working. We're definitely slanting towards the better performing commodities, and our investors have been rewarded with, with some moderate outperformance since our inception. Yeah, it's been a it's been a great product for sure. I want to make sure we get our last product in as well. It, uh, this did win a uh, Hidden Gems Award, so thank you very much for that, uh, Ryan. Jeff Wines, uh, Senior Portfolio Manager for Elkhorn Capital Group. Uh, let's take about five minutes, uh, run over by five minutes, and talk about Arcom because it it is a, a unique product. We thought it worthy of a of a Hidden Gem Award. Uh, let us know what it is, how it works, why investors should care. All right. Well, we thank you for that, Matt, and uh, thanks, Matt and team and all those that have dialed in. Um, we're definitely excited about the commodity alt space here at Elkhorn and uh, looking forward to being more involved in this space in the future. Uh, today, uh, as Matt mentioned, we are going to be presenting ARCOM as our favorite ETF, 
it's a collaborative effort between ourselves and uh, research affiliates out in Newport Beach, California, which is um, which was founded by Rob Arnott, a uh, name familiar to all of you, I'm sure, and uh, known as the godfather of smart beta. Um, Elkhorn is founded by Ben Fulton, another familiar name to you, no doubt, and uh, he's been involved in the commodity space uh, here and while at uh, PowerShares and developed many successful ETFs, including uh, DBC, which remains popular today. Um, so what I want to do is just take, make a couple of high-level points on RCOM, and um, then I'm going to skip right to slide five. Um, so let me get our slides forwarded here. There we go. So RCOM uh, is a broad-based commodity offering. It's got a, an allocation to all 24 of the GSCI components. It has no K1 for investors, and it is offered at 75 basis points. Uh, we believe that ARCOM really revolutionizes the commodity ETF space by incorporating um, the research affiliates smart beta technology. And ARCOM is really the first and only commodity ETF to combine momentum and role yield factors. So let's uh, go to the slide. There's not a ton of information on there. but. Um, I want to highlight what's special about ARCOM and what ARCOM does to solve the challenges with previous commodity offerings. And it really comes down to three simple steps. Number one, ARCOM dynamically weights the commodities by combining momentum with roll yield. Uh, they do that, we do that by ranking each commodity, 1 through 24, based on momentum. And then we separately rank each commodity, 1 through 24 again, based on roll yield on a macro level, so across all the commodities. And then these uh, rankings from these two sleeves or factors are uh, applied in a 50-50 application to get your final weight. So uh, this is important because momentum not only finds persistence in the supply-demand uh, of commodities, but it importantly mitigates over allocation to commodities based on attractive roll yield alone. Um, where a commodity looks attractive from a roll yield perspective, it, it could in fact be deteriorating and setting up for larger declines in the future. So adding the momentum here adds, adds um, a mitigating step. And I would say it's kind of like a, a value trap in equity investing. Step number two, is the uh, contract selection. Again, we're going to apply roll yield a second time, but this time at a micro level, and we're going to be looking at the futures curve of each individual commodity. This is important because it ends up resulting in lower turnover, lower volatility for the commodity chosen, and, there, and thereby higher returns. Final step, number three, um, frequent rebalances. Um, we have a monthly rebalance process, and this is important because in addition to the high volatility we've seen in the individual commodities, there's also been a lot of volatility in the term structure, flipping around from backwardization to contango uh, environments. And with the uh, frequent rebalance, we're able to you know, cap capture opportunities um, more frequently and get out of deteriorating situations more frequently. Let's quickly go to the next step, next slide. Okay. So what we have here is, is probably a familiar picture. Uh, this is something we did internally here uh, with our product team. We just created an efficient frontier. And what we did was blend a 60-40 equity bond portfolio with ARCOM in all possible allocations. And we did this for uh, BCOM and GSCI as well. We basically went from a 1% allocation, or actually a 0% allocation, all the way up to a 100% allocation to determine the most efficient mix to the blended portfolio. So this is our uh, proof of concept. And what we found is that BCOM and GSCI both had a most efficient allocation of 0%. ARCOM had a most efficient allocation at 
So we understand that that's really a high allocation. That's not reality um, for most people. But it does show that in spite of a tough period over the last several years, an investment in a commodity product that solves some of the previous challenges with product design could be additive. And poor results, which quite frankly are probably the number one reason uh, investors are not allocating to the space currently, is a fixable solution. So to conclude, um, our com was really built intentionally with precision. Uh, it was built to maximize investment results. It wasn't uh, built as a blunt instrument used to track something or to measure something. Um, and as Matt mentioned, um, you know, Alcorn and, and uh, Arcom is proud to have won the most innovative commodity ETF in 2016, as well as the Hidden Gems Award uh, just this month. Um, Arcom is currently the top performing broad-based commodity ETF year to date, and we really do feel it's the best commodity product in the market today. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, do you have one more closing comment, Jeff? Nope. That's it. Thanks for listening. All right. No, I appreciate it. So uh, I wanted to to say thanks to all of my panelists. Uh, if you want more insight on any of those products, you can go to the ETF Securities or USCF or Elkhorn websites. Uh, really want to appreciate John from World Bank joining us, and of course all of you for tuning in. Uh, 30 minutes, everything you need to know from commodities. I hope you'll join us again next week on our next weekly webinar. Uh, it's going to be an exciting one, looking into replicating uh, private equity returns. Uh, should be fun. So make sure you're there as well, and uh, talk to you all later. Thanks so much for joining. Bye-bye.